In 2006, Heroes began airing on NBC. While it was by no means the first live-action superhero property to make it big, it was unique for a number of reasons. First off, it was an entirely new IP, so it wasn't bringing in fans of any specific comic books or storylines. Now, it had to build an audience on its own, had to convince people that being invested in this world was worth their while. And it did, with an average of nearly 14 million viewers per episode during its first season. Yeah, Heroes was immediately a hit, connecting with a casual audience, but also creating super fans. This success was well-earned, too, because the first season is truly great. Great. Unfortunately though, most people don't discuss it all that much nowadays. Why? Well, because Heroes got bad. Really bad. Bleeding most of its viewers by its fourth and final season where it was unceremoniously cancelled after the promise of another story arc. What by all rights it seemed like television's next big thing faded away. Season by season. Until it was a hollow shell of itself. But before we get to that, I want to begin this retrospective talking purely about that great first season that connected with so many. Because there's a ton of stuff to love there, and this show was truly special. So let's discuss why Heroes deserves to be remembered. Wait, what is that in the... in the shadows? Ben? The one and only. I, uh, I said I was done with your shows, man. This video is about Heroes, not you. I'm Ben Tennyson, stupid. It's always hero time with me. Oh boy. Remember that sponsorship I snagged us in those videos though? Yeah. Well, I did it again. It's Raid Shadow Legends, the sponsor of today's video. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork. When you win matches, you'll get Live Arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses. All right, class, any questions? Yeah, Teach. What do you think about champions being banned in Live Arena? I hate it. I wish everybody could play. Back in school, I would always get picked last. But, you know, rules are rules. So. Go on, man. You ask him something. I... um... Don't embarrass me in front of Death Knight. Just tell him something you like about the game, then. Here, I'll go first. I love PvP Arena battles where I get to absolutely crush dweebs like you. Now you go. Some of the character designs are appealing. Like who? Oldbeard's pretty cool. Uh, Virgis is neat. Is that how you pronounce that? Virgis? Virgus? Oh, dude, great question. Is it? I hope you use this knowledge you've gained here today about Live Arena to head off and do battle. Live! Class dismissed! Well, nerd, I gotta go too. Raid just added a fearsome new boss, Akamari the Phantom Shogun. And I've got my weekly rewatch of Raid Call of the Arbiter. You seen it yet? Nope. Well, you should. All 10 episodes are on the official Raid Shadow Legends YouTube channel now. And, oh yeah, if you haven't played Raid yet, use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get insane bonuses. We are talking an epic champion knight errant. Never mind all the other useful stuff. That seemed to be a question that press wanted to ask me all the time. Did you know this was going to be hit? It was sort of like a standard question. And I always had this sort of standard answer of, well, you know, you hope and you keep your fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, but enough time has gone by and I, that I can confess that I knew it from the very beginning. A live-action superhero show was almost inherently ambitious. After a wild and crazy fights resulting from a unique clash of abilities is a huge part of what makes these stories fun. Regardless of how good a budget might be, creating convincing special and visual effects across a full season is going to be difficult. The logistics of putting this together? Yeah, it's a headache I don't even want to think about. But fortunately, the creators of Heroes clearly put a lot of thought into it because there really aren't that many fights or battles. Instead, the show plops us into a very self-serious, almost grounded world, where first and foremost, these powers are used as a vehicle to explore characters' unique personal struggles. However, this isn't to say that the creators of Heroes chose to make this easy on themselves or lacked ambition. No, they did not. Because instead of following a few characters with a few different abilities, this show bounces between loads of super-powered people and plot lines. Like first, we've got Peter Petrelli, a hospice nurse from New York who believes he's having dreams or visions of his future or some sort of destiny. For him, these powers represent an opportunity to be special, to be something truly great, and he desperately latches onto that hope. Second, there's Nathan Petrelli. In contrast to his brother Peter, Nathan doesn't even want to think about the fact he can fly. No, he's much more focused on his political career, and views this power as little more than a distraction. Third, Nikki Sanders, a cam girl from Las Vegas who struggles to support her son Micah. After borrowing money from a mob boss named Linderman, her life truly falls apart as he attempts to get his cash back with interest. However, after she passes out when some goons come to collect from her, she awakens to find that the people are dead, and she doesn't know why. 
fourth Mohinder Suresh, a university professor from India. His father researched these powered people and he is following in his footsteps. However, after learning of his dad's sudden murder, Mohinder becomes even more hyper-focused on finishing what his father started, heading to New York to find the special people who live there. Fifth, Isaac Mendez, an artist in New York who learns he can paint the future. In these pictures, he sees that New York will be wiped out by a massive explosion. Using his ability, he wants to stop this from happening, but there are a couple problems. For one, no one seems to believe him. Besides, his ability only works when he uses heroin, and he's quickly falling apart. Sixth, Hiro Nakamura, a bored salary man living in Japan who learns that he can control space and time. Excited about all the adventures in store for him, he tries to convince his friend and co-worker Ando that this is really happening. When he suddenly teleports himself to New York, though, it seems that his abilities may have more in store for him than even he imagined. Seventh, Claire Bennett, a high school cheerleader from Odessa, Texas. When she discovers that she has the ability to heal herself, she has to reconcile her newfound power with her desire for a normal high school life. Little does she know that her life was already far from normal, as her father works for a company that hunts and tracks these powered people. So yeah, there's a lot of characters and plot lines, except here's the thing, these are only the ones introduced in the first episode. So in episode 2, the struggling police officer Matt Parkman arrives. When he suddenly begins to read minds, this both helps and harms his career and his rocky marriage. But there's something bigger he has to look into, a super-powered serial killer named Siler, who he'll need to try and hunt down. Then there are many other characters who are introduced early, but gain more individual importance as the series continues. For example, Claire's father at first comes across as a minor antagonist of sorts, but later he has an entire episode devoted to him with flashbacks and all. It's easily the show's best episode, by the way. Then Siler goes from a mysterious presence to an in-your-face villain who gets his own tragic backstory. The likes of Nikki's husband DL and her son Micah get their own side plot and Ando sometimes separates from Hero, so then we follow him, too. The sheer number of plots and characters being juggled is kind of mind-boggling when I stop to think about it, and as far as I'm concerned, there's no clear protagonist in sight, regardless of what any wiki might tell you. So individual episodes will frequently have A through F plots, constantly flipping from character to character and plot to plot. By all accounts, this should be a mess of a story. And yet when I'm actually watching the show, that's rarely the case because the creators were incredibly clever with how they laid out and tied these plot lines together. First off, there's this solar eclipse. Though its mechanics are fuzzy, this global event is somehow related to these people's powers awakening. Regardless of how different they are, they're tied together in this, something of a shared origin story that's beyond their control. Second, the explosion in New York. See, it's not just Isaac who knows about this. No hero goes to the future and sees this too, so now his goal is to stop it. More importantly though, this event ties the characters together regardless of their knowledge about it. Because we learn about it very early on, and from there it looms over the narrative as more and more characters make their way to New York. As such, they're all involved in this, and it acts both as a ticking time bomb for a narrative that could otherwise lose momentum, and a solid mystery. After all, what's going to cause this explosion? Where will it come from? Will the heroes stop it? How will they stop it? These are all questions that will propel the narrative through the entire season. Third, the serial killer Siler. Again, this is something that many characters don't know about for a long time. Some of them for the entire narrative even. But just his existence glues these characters together. I mean, regardless of what else they're doing, he's a threat to all of them. Someone who can and does swoop into their stories and alter their course forever. Beyond that, because he is directly involved with many of them, getting details about him feeds into multiple storylines, meaning that there can be a sense of progress for a character, even if we aren't spending much time with them. Fourth, the mysterious company that Claire's father works for. Most of this season, it's unclear what exactly they're all about, but we do know one thing early on. They're kidnapping these people and doing something to them. But the truth about them isn't what matters here. What matters is that this is a group who, by design, has an interest in all of our disparate characters. Similar to Siler, they could hunt them down at any moment, and it adds an implicit tension to the story. Finally though, there's the smaller scale but equally important moment-to-moment -moment details, like transitions between scenes that encourage the viewer to consider the similarities or differences between these characters. Sometimes this is as simple as transitioning from one of Isaac's paintings to a real-life image. Or one character says he'll need another's help, and then we cut to another character's story where we will see what he needs help with. Many of these people reach their lowest moments at around the same time, or even experience similar events, being trapped in a cage, whether physical or mental. Characters flow in and out of each other's stories, weaving together to spend episodes together before rarely seeing each other again, but leaving a meaningful mark on their lives all the same. The writers also have a generally great understanding of where and when to cut off these scenes to give enough info that a viewer won't see it as a waste of time, but you'll still leave it a moment where you go, wait, I want to see what happens next. For all these reasons, the sheer number of stories and the differences between them are a strength rather than a weakness. Because instead of feeling random or haphazard, it's like we're getting unique superhero origin stories within a cohesive world. And we're just exploring that world from an impressive number of angles. But none of this conceptual stuff would mean much if the characters themselves weren't engaging. 
Fortunately though, they are. In fact, this ensemble cast is largely great and an element of the show I haven't seen discussed nearly enough considering that, in my mind, it's the primary reason for the show's initial success. So it's time to go through and analyze the stories that stuck out to me the most, starting with. In the first season of Heroes, Claire Bennett is an absolutely fascinating character. Her opening scene sets the tone exceptionally well, with this shaky camera footage of her jumping to her death. Except, of course, it isn't. She stands up, pushes the pieces of her broken body back into place, states her name, and that's that. Right away, her cameraman, Zach, asks her why she's doing this, and though she says she has her reasons and later will claim it was to show her biological parents, this comes across as retroactive logic. In reality, Claire just has a consistent, risk-taking, impulsive streak. Sometimes this feeds into her heroism as she runs straight into a fire to save a man's life, despite wanting to keep this ability a secret. Other times, the things she does are just plain weird, nothing short of self-harm pushed forward by a strange curiosity. Like picking up a scalding cupcake pan with her bare hands or shoving her arm into a garburator. To me, there's this feeling that she keeps pushing her body more and more because she wants to see when it will break. When she'll reach the point that she can go, oh, I'm at least this normal. But she never finds that limit. She's effectively invincible. No matter how much she tries to live in denial of that fact, she is no longer normal. Still, she lets Jackie, an old friend who is little more than a bully now, take credit for saving the man's life, because she isn't ready to commit to this yet and admit that she's no longer normal. The way this feeds into her relationship with her family is fascinating. After all, she seems close with them, but she still won't tell them what's going on. She's afraid. She doesn't want to ruin what they already have. Yet there are some scenes where she comes this close to revealing it, only to instead ask about something else, or in particular, her biological parents. Yeah, Claire's adopted, and though we don't get the sense this mattered much to her before, this strange ability gives her a goal. She needs to find them. She needs to know if there is someone else like her in this world and where these powers came from. This is the duality of Claire's character. She wants to maintain her old life, remaining the daughter of her loving adoptive mother and father and a popular fun-loving cheerleader, but she also can't keep denying what's happening to her. As much as she tries to cling to this old place of belonging, it feels foreign to her now, and she needs to find a new one. Like many of the characters in the show, Claire benefits from just how many ways the writers use her ability to push her in unique directions. For example, as soon as the third episode, a boy attempts to force himself on her, and as she struggles, the back of her skull is broken by a sharp branch. It embeds itself in her brain, killing her. So the boy hides the body, but when it's found and placed on the autopsy table with her chest cut open, the branch is pulled out of her head and she wakes up. So now her lack of normalcy has gotten really out of control. I mean, she can't even die, and she's going to have to decide what to do about this boy. It's really an interesting way to push her personal and powered life together, forcing her to acknowledge that these things can't remain separate. Still, at first, she tries to deny what happened to her. She hides it from her parents. She tries not to think about it. She doesn't have any proof. No one will believe her anyway. But then a girl comes up to her and asks what happened between her and him. Why? Well, because the same thing happened to her. So Claire manipulates the boy into letting her drive his car. Throughout the conversation, there's this tension, as you can't tell what Claire has decided to do yet. But as he shows no remorse for what he did, as he in fact threatens her, she crashes the car into a wall at an incredible speed. Because she's invincible and he's not and she isn't going to let him do this kind of thing to anyone else ever again. This scene is absolutely metal and definitely sold me on Claire's character. It's such a cool concept, a character who's invincible throwing themselves into a situation that will seem accidental so they can take out a bad person, and it's done exceptionally well. But what I like about Claire is that even here, she's uncommitted. What I mean is that after this, she goes to the boy and says that even though what he did was wrong, what she did was too. She might have done this in the moment, but she doesn't really want to hurt people like this. She just didn't know what to do, and that desperation makes her feel so much more real. But her attempt to take accountability here doesn't quite work out as she thought it would. Because this boy? He doesn't remember anything about himself. But Claire moves on, and as Zack secretly campaigns for her and she becomes the homecoming queen, it seems like things are looking up. Her mother encourages her when she has doubts about her identity, telling her, no one can tell you who you are. That's just something you gotta figure out for yourself. Similarly, Zack says she needs to embrace this side of herself, that it makes her special. She starts being true to her emotions, punching Jackie in the face when she gets out of line and bullies Zack. Finally, she even tells Jackie that she was the one who saved the man from the building. She's done lying to herself and others. She's taken her antagonist down a peg. It comes faster than I expected, but this feels like a proper resolution to her character arc. She has accepted who she is and...
The way the serial killer Siler crashes into Claire's storyline is so cool, and really reveals the strength of this multi-narrative approach. Because normally this type of thing would just feel random, but we've been hearing about Siler in the other plots. We even outright knew that he was going to attack a cheerleader and other characters are trying to help save her. But at the same time, we still get a moment for Claire where, when she is at her highest moment, a monster crashes into her life and throws it entirely off the rails in a scene that is terrifyingly well done. It reveals that her small victories in high school are just that. Small. There's something far bigger at play here and she has a part in it that she can't even begin to comprehend yet. And this is where Claire's father comes into focus, Noah Bennett. Noah Bennett is such a compelling character. Though he works for a company that tracks powered people, we quickly learn that he knows about his daughter's ability. However, instead of turning her in or even confronting her about it, he does everything he can to protect her, which includes having his powered company colleague erase this boy's memories. And this is what makes his and Claire's relationship so interesting. Because though Noah is trying to protect her, he's also doing everything he can to step between her and what she needs to understand what's happening to her and accept that fact. As such, when she wants to meet her biological parents, he has two of the company's employees pretend to be them so that she will stop chasing her past. Then whenever she tries to take accountability for her actions, he has that same colleague erase minds. He even does it to Claire's own brother when he learns too much about her, as well as her best friend Zack, the only person she could consistently chat with about these abilities. He even tries to erase her memory too, though fortunately the colleague refuses and simply pretends he's gone through with it. This way, Noah spends much of his time in the season acting as Claire's antagonist, isolating her and making her life hell, regardless of their clear love and care for one another. Regardless of the fact that, in his mind, he's doing it all for her. And that love is what makes Noah interesting, because yes, he can be a ruthless, terrible person, but he's also the type of guy who nearly breaks down into tears when he thinks someone might hurt his baby, who begs others to help him when he feels like he can't do this on his own. His love for her isn't for show, it's just deeply complex and flawed. The same way his daughter was living in denial of her ability, he is too. He can't accept that this is happening, that his family could fall apart, that someone could hurt his daughter. And the way Claire and Noah play off each other is brilliant. They're scenes full of double meanings, where each one thinks the other means one thing, but they're really discussing something deeper. Like when Claire begs her father not to tell anyone what happened between her and the boy, and he simply says, No one's gonna know. Really, Noah works so well because he serves as the ultimate challenge to Claire, an eventual realization that her life was never normal in the first place. After all, as she learns more about her father's work and as he tries to keep things the way they were before, she only realizes that this life she had with her father was a strange lie because she never knew who he really was. She thought he was a paper salesman, for crying out loud. Despite everything though, she has to pretend that it's normal, that she has forgotten what happened between her and Siler, that she has forgotten about watching Jackie die because otherwise, her dad might catch on to her. This way, Claire's never allowed to just rest or reach an equilibrium where she's accepted what's going on and things are easier for her. Now, the writers constantly find ways to challenge her without reversing her character development. It heightens her conflict regarding her biological parents too because now she doesn't even really have this family to fall back on. She needs to find them. But again, she's put through the ringer as her biological mother wants to see her, but her father does not. Besides, it's not like she could just run away from her home anyway as her mother begins to black out and forget who and where she is after having her memory wiped too many times. So Claire must stay here because someone needs to protect this family from the father she once loved so much. And this is where the show's best episode begins, Company Man. See, after doing all this to protect Claire, Noah's work with the company comes back to bite him as two powered people, the mind-reading Matt Parkman and radioactive Ted Sprague, break into his house and hold his family hostage until he tells them what the company did to them. So now Claire, who is just at the point of being done with her father, is forced to work with him in order to protect her mother and brother, as she purposely gets herself shot so her mother will live and plays dead so she can eventually help them escape. Meanwhile, her dad and Matt go to the company to collect any information they might have on him and Ted. The vast majority of this episode takes place inside the Bennett household, and it never moves away from Noah or Claire. It's the only episode in the show like this, using its claustrophobic setting and lack of other characters to ramp up the tension and danger. The only real breaks from the house serve to give context for the family's relationship as we see Noah's past, his bright-eyed naivete as he joined the company to help the world, the danger posed to his family, the fact that Claire was given to him in the first place as a company assignment, for him to watch over her and to tell the company if she developed powers, the partnership between him and a powered person who eventually he is given the job of killing, and finally, the moment his daughter helped him pick out the horn-rimmed glasses, the moment she learned she was adopted but still called him dad. Though he was a company man through and through in every other element of his life, in this relationship, he chose something over that he chose his daughter. And as the company realizes that she's developed an ability and asks Noah to bring her to them, he drives out to the same bridge where he once disposed of a traitor to the company. This time though, he's the traitor. He's the one who will be shot. 
and who will have his memory wiped. Because Claire needs to escape. The company can't have her, but they've also captured a mind reader who will know if he tries to lie. So he needs to truly believe that he was betrayed by his partner and that Claire was taken. The only way left to protect his family is to separate them, to break them apart. And in that case, has he even really succeeded in protecting them at all? But he and his daughter hold each other, and though Claire hasn't forgiven him for everything he did, she knows without a doubt that her father loves her, that he was doing what he believed was right. It's a phenomenal, heart-wrenching scene bolstered by brilliant performances and directing and writing, and it's the emotional climax of Claire and Noah's stories. The moment he has to accept that he failed and wronged her, but where she accepts that her family, even if things will never be normal again, is her family. It's an outstanding showcase of the type of emotional, tragic storytelling Heroes was capable of in its first season, and why this show stood out to so many. Right away, Matt Parkman is a character who's easy to root for. A down-on-his-luck cop who wants to do something more than direct traffic, but continually fails a detective exam due to his dyslexia. But he's too ashamed to mention this to anyone other than his wife who, as much as she tries to comfort and support him, just can't crack through his self-loathing. However, when he starts reading minds, things change and he gets involved in an FBI investigation. He needs to help the agent Audrey find Siler, and she's one of the only people who comes to believe in him despite her initial suspicions. First off, Matt's character arc is consistently engaging because of just how many different ways the writers find to use his ability. For one, Matt starts off locating a hidden little girl who was nearly killed by Siler, and he begins mending his broken marriage with his wife by reading her mind. But just as quickly, it all turns around on him. His ability begins to work against his will, he sees snippets of thoughts he didn't want to see, like that his wife is hiding something from him. Finally, just as his career prospects are at their brightest, as Audrey vouches for him and asks that he be allowed to do an interview instead of a written test, Matt learns what his wife's secret is. She's cheating on him with his old police partner. So he punches the guy in the face, derailing his career at the point when his marriage is at its lowest, too. So far, this isn't exactly a horribly complex arc, but what's impressive about it is how economical Matt's scenes are. In pretty much every one, we get a new view of how his ability can help or hurt his life, of how desperately he wants to use this to succeed, and how excited he is whenever this works out for him, contrasted by his life falling apart. One of my favorite scenes is here, where Matt comforts the radioactive Ted Sprague by telling him his wife's final thoughts before she dies. Though Matt is struggling at home with his own wife, he is able to give this guy closure. After all, even though Ted accidentally killed his own wife with his uncontrollable radiation, Matt can tell him that she doesn't blame him. Scenes like this, where he reaches out and tries to help someone who others are ready to shoot on the spot, just make him so easy to feel for, as his life progresses through this series of highs and lows before finally both his personal and work life fall to the wayside. Because there's a good reason Matt Parkman shows up at Noah's house to threaten him. Noah kidnapped him at some point, and though most of that day has been erased from his memory, Matt remembers enough to know that he's up to something, that he's somehow related to these powers and to Siler, to the reason Matt ultimately gets suspended from his job for six months, after he becomes hyper-focused on Noah but fails to bring any results. So after Ted escapes from police custody for the murder of his own wife, he calls Matt with some information he finds. Noah is definitely related to this company, they put trackers in them, and it's time to find out why. Watching Matt Partman navigate this insane, hostage situation is part of what makes that Company Man episode so engaging. At the start of the series, he was saving a frightened girl from her home, and now he's the menace who might end up killing someone. In many cases, this can make his character feel amoral or outright bad, but it really doesn't come across that way, because Matt quickly shifts to a bargaining position flipping from Ted's side to Noah's as he realizes that Ted is ready to blow up the whole house and kill everyone here if he doesn't get what he wants. The scene where Ted is ready to shoot Claire's mom and both Noah and Claire are directing their thoughts at him, demanding that he shoot Claire instead and he doesn't know that she'll heal but he still pulls the trigger? Man, it's intense, and the acting totally sells his confusion, fear, and desperation. He truly didn't come here to kill anyone, he didn't expect Noah to have his family with him. Like so many things in his life, the situation just got out of his hands. Now, Matt doesn't get quite as complete a character arc as Claire and Noah. For instance, he doesn't get to speak with his wife again after taking off with Ted, even though she told him that they're having a baby in one of their final scenes together. The closest thing he gets to a true conclusion is his team up with Noah, where they go to destroy the company's tracking system so that he can return to a normal life with his wife. However, we don't get to see the real outcome of that this season. Instead, Matt is unceremoniously shot during a fight with Siler in the final episode, and he's carted off, his fate left up in the air. Still, Matt's quest to find Siler and his eventual goal of taking down the company integrates him into the wider plot exceptionally well. Beyond that, the snappy pace of his scenes and all of his unique scenarios made him a splendid part of the first season, and someone who I was ready to see a lot more of in the following one. One of the most prevalent themes in Heroes is fate. 
It's obviously explored through special people granted abilities for unknown reasons and a bomb that's foretold to blow up New York. But it's also told through Mohinder Suresh's broken relationship with his father, who Mohinder once resented for moving away to New York to pursue his research. And it's hard to blame him for that, considering that his father snapped when he tried to connect with him. His father's reason seems to be that he wanted Mohinder to stay in India and have a successful life, not weighed down by his ambitions. But that's not how Mohinder took it. He thought he was unwanted, and he resented his father for that. Yet he couldn't pull himself away from his father's research or from their relationship, especially when he learns that Siler murdered him. So now it's not only time to finish what his father started, but to get revenge too. As you probably expect, Mohinder's complex relationship with his father is at the heart of his character. He obviously loves and admires this man, but his father kept many secrets. Secrets Mohinder only ever learns with the aid of a powered person who lets him see the past. The biggest of these secrets is that Mohinder had a sister named Shanti, who died when he was too young to remember. She had a strange disease, and his father's research led him to these people with special abilities. So his father had to do this. He had to keep looking deeper. He couldn't help it. For him, this was a compulsion and obsession bordering on destiny. And whether Mohinder likes it or not, he has that same desire, that same intellectual curiosity. Because that's just who he is, too. So Mohinder ends up in New York continuing the research, and from here, his plot really picks up. See, at this point, we know a decent amount about Siler, but Mohinder still knows nothing about who he actually is. So as Mohinder attempts to connect with the powered people on the list his father left behind, he finally gets someone who will agree to meet him. Zane. Of course, he goes to Zane's place, sees his ability, and they quickly connect. Zane felt lost in this world before now, and so did Mohinder. They gave each other a lifeline, so now they team up to find others like Zane and to help them understand that they aren't alone. Beyond that, with his help, Mohinder may be able to erase people's powers if they so desired or if they were dangerous. Easily my favorite part of Mohinder's story is how it uses dramatic irony from here. Because yes, Zane is actually Siler. Siler just got to Zane before Mohinder, killed him, assumed his identity, and used his own ability to steal Zane's. As such, even scenes that would normally feel pretty standard or like there isn't that much going on between them are injected with this weird tension. Mohinder is talking with his father's killer and doesn't even know it. In the moment where he confides in Siler, telling him about his dad's murder, oh boy, the way Siler turns into the red light, saying that they'll find them all, all of these people with powers. And Mohinder is unwittingly bringing one of the most dangerous men in the world right to the people he wants to save. It's an incredibly compelling moment, especially given that his father's team up with Siler is what led to his death. Even in this, it seems that Mohinder is following the same path as his father. But Mohinder eventually realizes his mistake and he drugs Siler, getting the information he needs from him for his experiments. After that, he goes to shoot and get this done. However, Siler overcomes the drugs and using one of his abilities, freezes the bullet midair. From here, another powered person, Peter, narrowly saves his life and they escape. But Peter seemingly died in the fight. Though Mohinder didn't die like his father, he has failed like him. Without any other idea of what to do, he connects with an organization he hated but now views as his only hope the stalkers from the company who have been keeping tabs on him and his research. This is where that tracking system I mentioned when I discussed Matt Parkman comes into play. Yeah, the company wants Mohinder's help fixing it, or should I say, her. That's right, the little girl Matt saved in the second episode is back, and she has the ability to find anyone anywhere in the world. That's her power. With her, the company would be able to pretty much instantly find these powered people and stop those who pose a potential threat, since that seems to be their goal. However, right now she's sick sick from the same virus Mohinder's sister died from, and it inhibits her ability. I love the moral dilemma that comes into play here. After all, Mohinder is well aware that the company is amoral at best, and they usually don't have powered people's best interests at heart. However, this is still a little girl who's going to die if he doesn't help her. So his father's two greatest desires, which he had continued to embody, finally clash. He can succeed at completing one of his father's missions, but not both. He can help protect these people, or he can save a little girl from dying. Really, it's hard to think of a better way to challenge him. But of course, Mohinder chooses to save her, using the cure that he discovers was within him all along. His blood, which contains special antibodies. Again, that concept of fate or destiny comes into play. The thing that could help him complete one of his father's missions was baked into his very DNA from the start and he only got to this point by following in his footsteps. At the same time though, it's possible that he's doomed way more powered people with this one act of kindness, and it leads to a natural question for his character in the second season. Will he be able to protect Molly from the company and succeed in both of his father's missions, or will he fail? Hiro Nakamura stands in stark contrast to the other powered people I've discussed so far, because my man is jazzed to have the ability to control space and time. 
He's a comic book fan aware of the trope, so he's ready to save the world and have fun doing it too, ideally with the support of his office worker friend Ando. Hiro is just such a lovable character, with his baseline emotion being this puppy dog-esque excitement. On top of that, he's an optimistic idealist who barely even thinks of using his power for personal gain. No, Hiro's gonna be a superhero, a force for good. No way he'd go to the dark side. When combined with more self-centered and opportunistic Ando, we get a comedic duo who definitely spices up a narrative that often can get pretty dang dark and depressing. I mean, look how pumped up he is when he sees the flying man. I love him. However, that's not to say that Hero is uninvolved with the main plot. Now, when he teleports to New York in just the second episode, he finds Isaac Mendez dead with his head cut open and the bomb explodes before he narrowly escapes back to the present. It's a cool twist that genuinely surprised me, when he realizes that he didn't just travel through space but also time, and more importantly than serving as a compelling hook for his narrative, it gives him a specific goal. He needs to stop the bomb. That's his hero's journey. But much like the other characters in Heroes, Hero encounters many challenges. See, though he follows Isaac's comic book about him from the future, using it as a roadmap for his journey and a confirmation that he's fulfilling his destiny, he frequently fails to live up to his expectations of himself as a hero. I mean, when a group of people die right in front of him and he fails to save them, it's only because of Ando that he's able to so quickly pick himself up. As Ando says, he can get a do-over later, can't he? It's moments like these that really convince me of their friendship, that as Hero says, this is their hero's journey, not just his. At first though, the details of this journey are pretty vague. After all, they need to stop this bomb, but how exactly are they going to do that? The only thing they have remotely close to a lead is Isaac Mendez, but that's just because he wrote this comic book and was dead in the future. However, they eventually connect with Peter Petrelli, who tells them that a version of Hero from the future came to him with one directive. Save the cheerleader, save the world. And now he'll need present Hero's help to do just that in Odessa, Texas. Still, despite having such a concrete goal for himself, Hero frequently gets distracted because he just wants to help people who are suffering right in front of him. Easily the best example of this is Charlie, a waitress he quickly connects with at the Burnt Toast Diner in Texas. Hero meets her while he's waiting for Peter there, and they quickly hit it off. She's a sweet, kind person who has an ability of her own. She can remember just about anything she reads or sees, so Hiro starts teaching her bits of Japanese. However, when he goes to the bathroom, the situation quickly takes a turn for the worse. Charlie is murdered by Siler, and after overlooking previous deaths, Hiro can't do that again. So he goes back, ignoring his mission in the present, stating that he'll be back in time and have enough control over his ability to both save her and save the cheerleader. Hiro's storyline with Charlie is one of the emotional cornerstones of season one. Watching this optimistic guy spend six months with her after mistakenly going too far back into the past. Watching him try to convince her that he's from the future so that he can protect and save her. Watching him perform these romantic gestures to not only show her he's being honest, but also because he has just grown to love her in this time. It makes him even more lovable. And it's impressive that Heroes was able to effectively insert a love story like this into a few scenes in a single episode. But it's the tragic end of this that really sells it. Because after they've grown close, Charlie reveals a secret about herself. She has a blood clot in her brain. She could die any day now. She's known about it for a long time, but due to how close they are now, she feels it's only right if he knows. And Hero's reaction? His, no, I was supposed to save you. I feel that, you know? Then he closes his eyes to kiss her and bam, he's back in the present, back in Japan, back where he started. He didn't save Charlie. He didn't help save the cheerleader. He failed. He has lost control of his powers and can't use them anymore. And this is the lowest point of his hero's journey. There's a lot to love about Hero's storyline so far. The way he wants to follow a typical superhero narrative, clearly symbolized by following a comic book of his life, but eventually reaches the point that he has to plainly admit to himself that life isn't a comic book after failing so hard, it hits and it works. But what hits equally hard is Ando's journey, where he starts off not believing Hero one bit, certain that his powers are a lie, but ends up becoming his number one support, picking him up when he returns from the past, telling him that they can still save the world and fulfill his destiny. So they go to Isaac Mendez, hoping to learn what they need to do next. From here, Isaac's paintings convince Hiro that he needs to find the sword of his childhood hero, a samurai named Takazo Kensei. He interprets this image of himself, thinking that surely if he finds the weapon, he will regain his abilities. What started off as a childlike excitement to wield the sword has morphed into duty. Eventually, he manages to steal the sword from Linderman, but to me, his story really picks up again when he travels to the future. Here we see what will become of the world if the bomb goes off, but it's more personal than before, because now we get to see just how broken everyone is. We learn that Siler will gain the ability to shapeshift, that he will steal Nathan's identity and become the president of the United States, hunting down all other powered people and killing them so he's the only one left standing. We see that Hero himself has become a violent extremist who doesn't think much of hurting others. We see that Ando is dead. This hits a lot harder than some bomb going off with relatively abstract consequences, because now it's about the characters we've invested ourselves in for 19 episodes, about what they stand to lose. And this is where Hero's next big challenge comes into play. 
because he's told that he's the one who needs to kill Siler. Yep, this happy-go-lucky man needs to become a murderer. And no matter how much of a monster Siler is, that isn't easy for him. In fact, Hero only makes this more difficult on himself by following Siler and learning about his past, seeing that there's an unexpectedly sensitive, sad side to him. And ultimately, Hero fails to steal his resolve, and Siler destroys his sword and Hero is forced to flee. Once again, this stands as a prime example of how the narrative will find deeper ways to challenge these characters. After all, this could have simply been hard because Siler is really strong or whatever, but no. The emotional component is what makes this interesting. The fact that Hero has to come to terms with what he needs to do. That he's going to kill another human being and that this is so far from the destiny he imagined for himself in episode 1. But after this, Hero has a conversation with his father, who never really believed in him up till now. In the past, we have seen he's somehow related to the company, but he isn't working for them now. Not really, anyway. Instead, he's here to teach his son a lesson, to help him prepare to kill, and so Hiro hears of his childhood hero Kensei again. The story of how he tore his own heart out to save the woman he loved. And though Hiro heard the story many times in his childhood, it's only now that he comprehends its deeper meaning. To save what is most important, I must be strong enough to cut out my heart. So even if it hurts, even if it's something he would never want to do, he must kill Siler. That's the only way for him to be a hero, to fulfill his destiny. Beyond that, it was never the sword that gave him his abilities back. No, this ability was inside him all along, and he was only able to keep going because of Ando. And so Hero stabs Siler and succeeds in completing that hero's journey he wanted so badly, even if it's not what he expected. In a lot of ways, Hero's plot is exactly what you would expect from a hero's journey. It hits many of the typical beats of that structure, but it does so with this bittersweet edge that elevates such a story. After all, Hero doesn't get to save Charlie and he still has to kill, but he also succeeds in fulfilling his destiny and he helps save the world. And man, does it feel good to see such a likable character succeed in doing just that. As far as I'm concerned, Siler is a huge reason for the initial success of Heroes. He's a brilliant character and a near-perfect villain. Of course, I've already gone over how his existence as a serial killer ties these characters together, but his appeal goes a lot deeper than that. See, outside of one voicemail message, it takes nine episodes for Siler to say a single line of dialogue, and I think that is one of the best decisions this show made. Instead of immediately throwing him in as a verbose, in-your-face character, they made him a horror movie monster who stalks his prey in the shadows, a creature every bit as mysterious as he is frightening. At this point, his power set is uncertain, but his commitment isn't. He will kill you if he wants to and he gets the chance, whether you're a man, woman, or child. For a while, the exact reason for this is uncertain, however, his terrifying the terrifying murder of a screaming cheerleader no doubt burned his presence into viewers' minds, and his other brutal killings stood in stark contrast to any expected superhero tone. It was like Seven meets X-Men, and it was sick. However, after failing to kill Claire, he's captured and caged, and we are given his backstory. Before he was Siler, he was Gabriel Gray, a humble and kind, if somewhat shy and eccentric, watchmaker. But when Mohinder's father found him and told him he had a special ability, everything changed. Because Gabriel had always dreamed of being exceptional. Though there was nothing wrong with his parents exactly, they were so normal. And he felt he could be more. And the acting gives each of his scenes here so much nuance, you can feel his pure desperation to be something better than average and forgettable. And that though he doesn't seem like a bad guy at first, there's a hunger in him, and anger too. Especially when Mohinder's father tells him, after repeated failed tests, that maybe he was wrong. Maybe Gabriel isn't special. So Gabriel steals one of his notes and meets with another powered person, and it's only then, as he looks at this person the same way he looked at so many of his timepieces, that it clicks into place. He knows his power. It's understanding how things work. He just needs to look at the inside, and then he can mimic the power for himself. So he kills this man and returns to Mohinder's father with telekinesis. Now they can work together to find all these people, but we know how that story ended, don't we? The writers really toe a fantastic line here. After all, shining a light on this monster could have easily weakened his status as a terrifying villain, but it absolutely doesn't. No, Gabriel Gray is every bit as frightening as Siler. In fact, how unassuming he is before his first kill just makes him freakier. Because now it's not that he's some faceless villain. He used to be normal until he found out he might be special and it broke his brain. Beyond that, this info comes at the perfect time to make him more threatening. After all, though there were definitely hints before, now we know what he wanted from Claire. 
her ability, and it's easy to imagine how much more terrifying he would be if he were effectively invincible. Still, the writers managed to keep a certain air of mystery to him. After all, we don't know exactly how many powers he's taken yet, so sometimes he's able to seemingly break the rules without it quite being a contradiction. Yet there's another side to Silo that somehow feels real despite how evil he is. Because after he kills Isaac and copies his ability, he paints and comes to believe that he will cause the explosion that dooms New York. This even manages to shock and disturb him, bringing him back to his past life as Gabriel Gray just long enough for him to call Mohinder in a panic. These people don't deserve this, they're innocent, their deaths would be meaningless, and certainly not part of this survival of the fittest or natural selection line of reasoning he previously used to justify his actions. But Mohinder tries to turn him into the police, so Siler vanishes. He will go see the only person he has left, his mother. This scene between Siler and his mom is nothing short of brilliant because it manages to cast all of Siler's actions in a new light without undermining what made him so compelling in the first place. Because it's through her that we get a deeper look into his desire to be special. With so few lines of dialogue, we explore a tense relationship between a son who just wants love and a mother who refuses to listen to his words, who attempts to live a special life vicariously through him. Even when he breaks down and begs her to tell him that it's okay to be normal, to leave being special behind, she refuses. She won't tell him that because she knows he's made for greater things. But when he decides to show off his powers to her and she gets scared, demanding that her real son be returned to her, you can feel Siler's pain and anger. She wanted him to be special, so how could she reject him for finally being just that? Still, regardless of his apparent issues with his mother, he loves her and he wants her acceptance. But she attacks him, and in the scuffle she dies, leaving Siler alone without her, casting away any of his remaining humanity as he draws the explosion with her blood on the floor. It's a tragic, disturbing scene that digs right to the heart of this character, to an idea that I didn't really expect the show to tackle. What if being special is every bit as much a curse as it is a gift? What if the idea of being special could torture someone and lead to them doing these terrible, terrible things? And this is easily one of the best scenes in the whole show, at the same time cementing Siler as an iconic villain. Earlier I claimed that Heroes doesn't have any single protagonist, and I stand by that. After all, I went through and calculated the screen time each character receives in the first season because I'm insane, and it's shockingly close across the board. However, there is a character most considered to be the protagonist, Peter Petrelli. And it's easy to see why the audience would view him as the MC. With his ability to absorb others' powers, he's one of the only ones who can stop Siler, and beyond that, Siler acts as something of a foil to him. Where Siler steals powers, Peter copies them, and they both have an obsession with being special. More unexpectedly though, this makes Peter central to the bomb plot as well, since he's one of the only people who could potentially be the exploding man Isaac eventually paints. Either way, Peter's storyline is definitely interesting. Somewhat similar to Hero, he doesn't find the idea of these powers scary or really uncomfortable. Instead, he latches onto them, but his excitement is different than Hero's. He's more somber and serious, coming at this with a certain desperation, like that this will finally give his life proper purpose or meaning. See, despite the fact that he works as a hospice nurse, a no doubt important and meaningful job, it's clear that he doesn't view this as enough. This in part stems from the likes of his family, and in particular his brother, who calls his job cute, and is far more focused on how much he's paid than how many lives he touches. And really, that complex relationship between Nathan and Peter is at the heart of their story, as Peter has visions of his brother and comes to believe that he can fly. But Nathan takes a somewhat similar view of these powers to Claire. He wants to pretend everything is normal. What would flying do for him anyway? Who would it help? His political career is far more important, and in the end, he twists everything that happens to him in a way that will increase his chances of winning the upcoming New York election. Even when Peter does jump off a building and force Nathan to reveal his power of flight, Nathan turns around and lies, telling the whole world that Peter tried to off himself because in his mind, anything else would damage his reputation. That's what makes these two brothers so interesting to me. They are both equally obsessed with power, willing to manipulate the other into helping them achieve their goals, but they have different flavors. Peter truly does want to help and even save the world, while Nathan seems more power hungry on a basic level. He just wants to win. So Nathan will lie to Peter's face and seriously hurt him. By the same token though, Peter will threaten to jump off a building again if Nathan doesn't tell the truth. They are both deeply flawed, broken people, and watching them play off each other is fascinating. Especially because at the end of the day, their love for each other is evident. See, after Peter finally gets his message from future hero, save the cheerleader, save the world, he asks for Nathan's help procuring one of Isaac's paintings from his associate Linderman. Why? Well, the painting might show him where this cheerleader will be. But when Nathan sees the painting, when he sees what looks like Peter dead on the canvas, 
he destroys it. He's still lying to and manipulating his brother, but this time it's out of a genuine desire to save his life. Beyond that, when Peter finds his way to Claire's high school anyway and gets seriously injured saving her, who's the one who goes to look after him? And then who's the one who stands at Peter's bedside when Peter's body begins to overload from all the abilities he's absorbing and he's stuck in a hospital bed? It's Nathan, because Pete is his little brother and he loves him. None of this is to say that Nathan is an upstanding person, far from it. Throughout most of the story, he's doing terrible stuff, like cheating on his wife and lying to her face when she needs to know he's there for her, like taking millions for his campaign from Linderman, who he believes purposely caused the accident that landed her in a wheelchair in the first place, like siding with Linderman further when this mob boss maniac reveals his true ambition as the company's figurehead. He wants the bomb to go off in New York. If it does, he believes the world will rally under a common cause. More importantly for Nathan though, Linderman will use this to propel him to presidency. He even has the painting from Isaac to prove that it will happen. That's his destiny. At this point, he even learns that Peter is the one who would explode. But since Peter's now absorbed Claire's ability, he would survive, and so Nathan agrees to the plan. Whenever he does question this path, his mother, who is also one of the company's leaders, is there to tell him that this is the correct way forward. And it's through her that we get to see a bit of how someone would turn out this way, with how she tells Nathan that he's the only one who can make these tough but necessary decisions, telling him that he must do this. Nathan might sometimes manipulate Peter, but he is every bit as manipulated by their own mother. However, there is still one source of doubt that can break through Nathan's villainous side, Claire. Because Claire is his daughter, who his own mother hid away from him as part of the company's plan because they couldn't have this baby born out of wedlock ruining his political aspirations and the plans they had for him. When Nathan nonetheless learns of her existence, the conflict for him feels incredibly real. The way he meets with Claire's biological mother, but at first refuses to even look at a picture of her. He's already chosen his path, and he doesn't want Claire to somehow change that, to make him soft. But he still looks because he can't help himself, because no matter how much others see him as a monster or a villain, there's still part of him that wants to do the right thing and wants to be loved. And Peter is one of the big reasons for that. See, Peter's arc is all about connection, a great match for his absorption power. After all, once he starts overloading with abilities, he finds a teacher, Noah's old partner, who might know how to control his powers but hates people. Through his conflicts with him, Peter is able to realize the truth about his ability. It's about emotions, about accepting that connection with others. If he can do that, he can control this. Of course though, it's not like he can just flip a switch and manage that. And after saving Claire, Peter spends most of his storyline suffering and failing. His girlfriend is accidentally shot and murdered when Isaac's trying to kill him because he believes Peter's the bomb. He tries to go to Mohinder for aid, hoping that he can somehow help Peter control this, but he is instead killed by Siler before he, of course, comes back to life with Claire's ability. He puts his faith in Nathan, who he still believes is his lifeline no matter how much evidence points to Nathan betraying him, but when they meet, he sees that he's made the wrong choice yet again. Nathan knows about the bomb. Nathan wants Peter to explode. Finally, when Peter faces off against Siler, he isn't the one who delivers the final blow, regardless of how much other characters tell him he's their only hope. Instead, Hero swoops in, and Peter is left losing control of his explosive ability. As such, Peter's only through and through victory is saving Claire, and that happened a long time ago. But in the end, that theme of connection comes back once again, because saving Claire was enough. See, rescuing Claire doesn't save the world simply because Siler failed to steal her ability and now Hero was able to beat him. Instead, Claire eventually comes face to face with Nathan, learns his plan, and refuses to go along with it, reprimanding him, telling him that he's a monster. She leaps out of a window and she's the only one who can get close enough to stop Peter from blowing up. However, then Nathan arrives. The dialogue doesn't make this explicit, but the acting makes it clear enough, and the scene is all the better because of that subtlety. Seeing Claire reject this, seeing Peter's belief in him, it made Nathan change. Without that connection that Peter got him by saving the cheerleader, Nathan wouldn't have been here. So this is how saving the cheerleader saves the world, because it allows for an unexpected moment of connection between two brothers, as Nathan asks Peter if he's ready, and carries him away from everyone here. Saving New York and saving his brother from the torment of killing all these people. To me, that's the heartfelt twist at the end of this season and the thing that truly sells its theme. It's not some massive battle that saves everyone, it's not some intelligent plan or scheme. It's one brother's love for another, and a self-centered man being moved by his daughter to sacrifice his life to save the world. Where Hero's story was largely about accepting his destiny and rising to the occasion, Nathan's is about defying destiny for the sake of his brother and the sake of the world. A beautiful thematic contrast and a wonderful note for the season to go out on. Overall, I hope this look back at the initial season of Heroes has reminded those of you who watched it why it was so beloved in the first place. Meanwhile, if you've never seen it before, maybe you can understand what made it special. But just as there are good reasons for it to be remembered, there are good reasons that it has been largely forgotten. 
because Heroes doesn't just get bad, it gets legendarily bad. And with Season 2, it quickly became obvious that Heroes had lost its way. In fact, maybe the signs were there from the very start. 